our belief that our memories and our ability to accurately recall them is so flawed. I'm here to convince you today that our minds are much less amazing, much less reliable than we think they are. I'm going to show you a short video. It's a study that was conducted at Harvard University in 1999. There are going to be people passing a basketball back and forth to each other. I want you to count how many passes are being made by the people wearing white. Be sure to count both aerial passes and bounce passes. the population surveyed, you counted 15 passes and did not see the gorilla. In the book, The Invisible Gorilla, they state, we all believe we are capable of seeing what is in front of us, of accurately remembering important events from our past, but these intuitive beliefs are often mistaken ones that can mask critically important limitations of our cognitive abilities. The book identifies seven illusions in our everyday lives, two of which I will recap today. The illusion of attention. We experience far less of our visual world than we think we do. This is normally a good thing. I mean, imagine if we took in every single bit of stimulation we are presented with. But the problem arises when we don't realize our limitations, as in this real world example. Many people talk on the phone while driving, even though it has been widely proven that drivers react slower to stoplights, take longer to brake or move to avoid a collision, and suffered from reduced awareness of their surroundings, people still believe they can do both because so far, they have. In most cases, drunk driving and driving while using a cell phone do not lead to accidents because A, most driving is predictable, and B, most other people are alert and trying not to collide with you. <laughs> Some of you might be thinking, but I use hands-free. There's no difference between driving with a hands-free set or not because it is your attention that is at play here, as demonstrated by the video. Talking on a phone is easy. Driving a vehicle is easy, but both draw upon the mind's limited stock of attention resources. No matter what you believe about multitasking, the fact is, the more attention demanding tasks your brain does, the worse it does each one. The illusion of memory. Do this uh, quick memory test, just have a read. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. <laughs> How do we think memory works? 50% of those surveyed believe that once you have been experienced an event and formed a memory of it, that memory doesn't change. And even more believe that human memory works like a video camera, accurately recording the events we see and hear so that we can review and inspect them later. In actuality, memories fade or morph over the years and can be influenced by the motives and goals of the rememberer. This is the premise of my latest body of work, Memories Are Malleable. What is stored in memory is not an exact replica of reality, but a recreation of it. We cannot play back our memories like a video. Each time we recall a memory, we integrate whatever details we do remember with our expectation of what we should remember. Has anyone ever told you a story in such vivid detail that you felt like you were there? Maybe you have gone on to retell that story as your own, genuinely believing that it has happened to you. It sounds crazy, and indeed we have labeled it as crazy. In the case of Hillary Clinton during her election campaign, describing a harrowing mission to Bosnia 10 years earlier, landing under sniper fire and running for cover. Her accounts of events was rapidly and ruthlessly identified as wildly embellished as video, video footage emerged of her very calmly getting off the plane to, in fact, a greeting ceremony. Society vilified her and labeled her a liar. But like all fallible human minds, hers may have automatically and unconsciously reconstructed the episode in Bosnia to merge her own experience with how she knew or had seen others unfold. Unlike in Hillary Clinton's case that was televised, we usually don't have any feedbacks about these limits. We don't know what we didn't notice, and we don't know what we didn't remember. Our minds also fill in the gaps to create new memories. Recall the list of words I asked you to remember. Was the word dream one of them? Yes. Was the word sleep? 
No, it wasn't, but I bet you remember it to be, as all the words were around the word sleep, and we tend to fill in the word sleep. Such is how false memories are suggested to us. When we perceive something, we extract the meaning from what we saw and generally ignore the details that do not support the meaning we concluded. It would be an uncharacteristic waste of energy for our brain to take in every possible stimulus and to store everything we perceive, so instead it takes in what we have seen or heard and associates it with what we already know. These associations provide retrieval clues, but they're not always accurate. Years ago, living in Western Australia, I hiked a 100 kilometer section of the Bibbulmun Track. Myself and two friends were at the trailhead in Albany, and my friend's parents, Carol and David, were seeing us off. We were about to set off, and a dog came running out of nowhere as a vehicle was passing about two meters away from us, and ran him over. It was a gruesome sight and sound, and the dog ran yelping into the bushes. No one was around, there was nothing we could do, so we bid farewell and began the hike. The next week was an eventful adventure of physical difficulty and stamina, the most phenomenal ocean views, towering carry forests, exhausting heat, long stretches of beach, cold swims, strengthening friendship, and long periods of quiet contemplation. I returned to work the following week and told my bosses about my hike. She zoned in on the very beginning of it, when I saw the dog get run over and asked if Carol had let go of the leash. Yes, she must have, I replied. It was really horrible. That suggestion that the dog was Carol's seeing eye dog slipped so seamlessly into my story that even I didn't notice it. Yes, Carol was blind and her seeing eye dog was with us when we walked the first few meters. Yes, we saw a dog get run over right beside us during these same first few meters, but they weren't the same dog. <laughs> How could I misremember that? Would I have told the story that way if that connection had not been suggested to me? Yes, it was an exciting and emotional week with hundreds of details that were new to my senses, but I felt so impacted by them. I thought I remembered them so vividly. I was shocked by how easily my story had changed and why, for dramatic effect, consciously, unconsciously? That firsthand experience left me confused, but had no real or lasting consequences. It did, however, give me new insight into what Julia Shaw, professor of forensic psychology, calls false memories. As a researcher, Shaw studies how false memories arise in the brain and applies it to the criminal justice system. Contrary to what many believe, human memories are malleable, open to suggestion, and often unintentionally false. False memories are everywhere, she says. In everyday situations, we don't really notice or care that they're happening. We call them mistakes, or we say we misremember things. In the criminal justice system, however, they can have grave consequences. Studies show that the subtle ways a question is pitched affects what a witness reports. The feedback given to a witness can modify how confident they are in their memories and can drastically shape those recollections. This has the opportunity for implanting false memories, purposefully or not. Ultimately, poor interrogation methods can lead to mistaken eyewitness accounts, baseless accusations, and even false confessions. Shaw asks, why do people confess to things they never did? I think the most fascinating examples aren't because of torture or because they felt like they had to, but because they actually think they did it. Shaw conducted a study in 2015 to prove that innocent people could be manipulated to confess to crimes that had never even occurred. The combination of seemingly undeniable story, backed up by real autobiographical details, visualization and performance pressure, did indeed result in a high percentage of her participants admitting wrongdoing. Shaw hadn't put undue stress on the participants. In fact, she had treated them in a friendly way. All it took was a suggestion from an authoritative source and the subject's imagination did the rest. Think about the dilemma a, subject, a sub suspect now faces. I don't have a memory for this, but the person who took care of me does. Therefore, it must be true and I have to find a way to remember it. Shaw uses the study as proof of memory's fallibility. I always go through the study when I talk to police, she says. They see themselves in that scenario and need to think, this could be me implanting false memories in a witness or suspect. Yet our society and our justice system places an enormous amount of value on a confession, no matter how it was obtained. Unfortunately, there are countless examples of false confessions. Documentaries Making a Murderer or The Central Park Five showcase this phenomenon. 
Police and investigators are under huge pressure to convict a suspect and close a case. The good news is, increasingly, interrogations are being videotaped and police are trained to question less suggestively and more objectively. And in some countries, though not ours, it is illegal for police to present false information to a witness to suggest they know something when they don't actually. But most effectively, technology is hugely improving the accuracy of events, relying on facts rather than memory to solve a case. Shaw thinks the courts should adopt a new oath. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, or whatever it is you think you remember? <laughs> I'm going to show you how I translated these findings into a series of glass panels for this exhibition. But first, let me back up 17 years. supposed to be a nice picture of ACAD there. Hmm. Um, my journey in glass started at Alberta College of Art and Design in Calgary. I began, as most first years do, in the graphic design program. I learned a lot of color theory, layout and design, and I remained interested in 2D media throughout my degree, taking life drawing classes, silk screen on paper, and silk screen on fabric courses. After the first year, I switched to a major in glass. I was drawn to the physicality of the hot shop. Unlike other media, like drawing or painting, this was a completely different way of creating, and it required a lot of technical learning before we could begin to make what we set out to. It was also the first 3D media I had ever really worked in. This is some early work. The primary focus of, at ACAD was not to learn technical proficiency, but rather to research concepts and develop our ideas through our chosen medium. This was my final work in my graduating year. It was hot glass poured into wood frames I had cut and wall mounted. It's 12 feet wide. Right after graduation, I got hired by Julia Reimer and Tyler Rock at Firebrand Glass in Black Diamond to be their full-time studio assistant. This involved assisting in the hot shop with making production work, but also with demos, events, cold working, and packing work for the galleries. In the evenings, I made my own work. These are some of the very first few designs that I made and sold, starting to get into galleries around Calgary and Western Canada. During my time at Firebrand, I learned a lot about the business of being an artist. Pr pricing work, dealing with galleries, building my CV, balancing production work with exhibition work, bookkeeping, branding, marketing. After a year of working for Firebrand, I moved to Perth, Australia to work for Peter Bowles and Anne Clifton. Their studio was called Glass Manifesto and was again mostly a glass blowing studio with some kiln work. A gallery. By day I assisted Pete and Anne making their work and was being trained to make some of their designs as well. They had an extremely varied practice including hot poured wall panels, this here was the very first photo I took in Australia. It's a paper bark tree and became the start of a fascination with texture that would come up again and again in my work. I developed many new series in the months and years to follow. Desert scenery of red dirt began showing up in my designs. So did more advanced cane work. I began carving wood and making blown glass pieces to fit originally keeping the marks made by the tools, then working up to a smooth surface with more considered mark making. The coast was a snorkeling paradise and that found its way into my work as well. Pete specialized in cane and marini work and my ex increased exposure to that technique gave me more confidence in my own design while keeping it playful. This work culminated in my first ever solo exhibition called Headspace in Perth. I had lots of time to experiment in the hot shop. I had no family, few friends, no other commitments. I was fortunate to be able to commit so fully to my glass practice uninterrupted during that time. Continuing education was vital for me. I traveled across Australia for three national glass conferences in my time there. This is a demo by Lisa Cahill whose work was hugely inspiring for me, even though at the time I'd never worked in flat glass before, it spoke to my desire to make 2D work. This was a workshop with Catherine Gray at the Jam Factory in Adelaide. In the male-dominated art form of glass making, this woman is a superstar in design and technical ability. 
I learned how to wood turn during this time and made some exhibition work where I mirrored form in wood, blown glass, and felt. Back at the studio in Perth, it was also an intense period of learning for me. Getting introduced to large-scale public artworks that Pete and Anne were awarded. This one was for a hospital. And several parts of this cathedral renovation, including a baptismal font, the Stations of the Cross, an altar screen, decanters, and several dozen of these large windows. In my last months in Australia, I worked less on my production work and solely on developing my Marini works. I pushed my technical skill by learning color cups and my design ability by playing with transparent color inside opaques. This repetition of pattern comes up time and time again in my work. Here I'm rolling up the Marini on a color bubble, smoothing out the Marini pieces, blowing out the vessel. Uh, this is the finished work that I exhibited in Sydney. This period was full of freedom within my art practice, but also my spiritual one. I was introduced to Buddhism at exactly the right time, when I was on my own, on the other side of the world, and could work out what I needed without having to defend its ideas or explain myself. I spent many weeks on meditation retreats in the Serpentine Hills south of Perth. Hiking brought me to each corner of Australia. My boyfriend Jim and I did many long week-long hikes. This is part of the Cape to Cape, 140 kilometer trek with plenty of beach walks. We hiked in the Blue Mountains, New South Wales, and the Overland Track in Tasmania. During my time in that country, I took hundreds and hundreds of photos of the ground that I traveled over, usually on hikes. Sometimes on meditation retreats. But in the end, this Canadian was no match for the extreme heat long term, and it was time to go back home. Jim and I moved to Calgary in the summer of 2011, got married in the bushes outside of Kelowna five days later, found a cat in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, moved to Elkford, BC, and had a baby, <laughs> bought a massive kiln with the intention of making large-scale works for public art, and built a cold shop. I was awarded my first Canada Council grant in 2012 to make this series called Held. These were based on the images I'd taken in Australia, mostly of the ground, but in this case, a friend's hardwood and rug, places that had supported me. I translated the photographs into glass by layering color in the kiln, then drawing on a resist and sandblasting through the layers of color, revealing the image. Seaweed on the beach, referring to our Wilson's Promontory hike in Victoria, Australia. I resumed blowing in Black Diamond at Firebrand Glass, teaching workshops there and doing demos at their events, renting their studio to make my own work, I registered my own business for the first time, continued to develop new series of production work and increased my gallery representation. I was finding my voice in the kiln and sought to ab abstract my wall panels. A solo exhibition at the Fernie Art Station called Along These Lines was a mix of blown and kiln formed work. This is work for a group show at the Leighton Arts Centre. I travelled to Ontario to attend a national glass conference at Sheridan. This is Catherine, and a Catherine Gray demo. Um, and I got to assist in a demo. It was great to be in the big city and be exposed to all the things I'm missing in a small town. Uh, which is a big part of why I joined the board of the Glass Art Association of Canada, to connect with the wider glass community. Mm -hmm. Back home, I'm designing new Marini pieces. Going back to playing with a push-pull of transparents and opaques. Continuing to find my voice in kiln form glass, here I'm abstracting the shape of a mouth using the sand carving technique. That's after fire polishing. 
Uh, this is the same series, The Shape of Parenthood. This one is Vitrograph Marini. It's a detail shot. I got commissioned to make an artwork to celebrate Canada 150. Here I am drawing out a hiking scene before sand carving it. Uh, that's the Ponderosas after sand carving. It's one of the finished panels of six. I was awarded a CKCA grant to take a Vitrograph Marini workshop in Portland at Bullseye Glass. This had me excited to bring a technique I've long worked with in blown glass into my kiln formed practice. It's a completely different process. First, I cut 35 glass circles to fill a small crucible, then pull the hot glass out of the crucible to make cane. Vitrograph cane has very different properties than hot shop cane. You can achieve many more rings of color very crisply. I chopped up the cane into marini. This work has over 10,000 individually cut pieces. This work is called Pulse and is 35 inches by 20 inches. I made it for a bullseye glass competition called Emerge. Uh, the same technique, but slumped in a mold. I took a pottery class with Sarah Pike to learn to make stamps. I wasn't looking to pursue stamping in pottery, but rather to find a way to bring it into my glass practice. Here I did repetitive stamping to make tiles. I used these tiles as molds to fire my glass on, picking up the textured surface. I fused a hundred of these tiles to make this piece wheat fields. I hung these tiles from an old auger, speaking to the free parcels of prairie land given to European settlers a century ago. Here it is installed at the Centre 64 Gallery in Kimberley, BC, and is now at the Fish Creek Park in Gallery in Calgary. I made more of these tiles for a collaboration with Jamie Gray for the Accord exhibition in Calgary. This is called Utter Terror. <laughs> she is the funny one, not me. That is all to her credit. I showed these works in a group exhibition landmarks with Julia Reimer and Tyler Rock at the Alberta Craft Gallery in Edmonton. I do commissions such as this one for the Rocky Mountain Elementary School. Here I'm drawing on the resist, cutting it out and about to sandblast it. The completed triptych. So, detail. In between commissions and exhibition works, I have several series of production pieces. These marini pendants. This series is called Overreacted. Um, I grind texture into my kiln formed platters. I make awards <laughs> and I have three young boys who are more wild than I ever imagined my children would be. I get out hiking a lot with kids and occasionally without. This is at Lake O'Hara in Yoho National Park. This feeds my practice in so many ways. Sometimes those ways are tangible. Here I'm preparing a submission for a public artwork that I was later awarded. Here I'm mapping out the hiking trail on Google Earth, the pass in the clouds. Then I'm working out the imagery that will go on each panel. This work will be installed later this spring in Elkford. Which brings me to this past year, making work for this exhibition. I spoke earlier of my research into the fallibility of our memories. I began this project creating what I call stock sheets of glass, that is sheets of pattern and texture that I made by sifting glass powder over objects to catch their silhouettes. This was an experimental time for me. I ran bike tires through glue then over glass sheets before coating in glass powder. I walked my son's winter boots through the same. I used magnets to collect the small buried metal bits like coins, keys, gold crucifix. I imprinted bubble wrap, kiln bricks, metal grating. This was my rudimentary form of stencil making. These stock sheets are to represent a motivation for a memory. I labeled them fault, truth, posterity, attachment, wishful thinking, and others. I cut and reassembled these segments to form a narrative. This action represents the deconstruction and reconstruction of recalling a story. 
This is the first panel I finished, 20 inches by 20 inches. In naming these works, I used a metaphoric recipe. This one is called Two Parts Saving Face to One Part Protection. After completing most of this body of work, I was researching other ways to get images into the glass for another project, and I came across the technique of powder printing. I watched a few videos, bought some screens, rented a printmaking studio in Calgary, and tested and tested and tested. To great result, this technique has really transformed the level of detail I can bring into my glasswork. I immediately rummaged through my closets and photographed my Buddhist beads from my wedding, my first maternity skirt, an old blouse from uh, my Ukrainian dancing days. I took the onesie off my newborn's back, the Mr. Potato Head out of my toddler's toy bin, and my, his favorite book off his shelf. I took images of the mesh from a trampoline from my coaching days, the board of a clue game, song notes from my first choir musical, brick from my parents' fireplace. I printed these images onto transparency sheets, then burnt them onto silk screens. Back at my studio, I used a squeegee to push the glass powder through the screen and onto the sheet glass and carefully lifted them into the kiln. I fired these and cut them up the same way I did with the original stock sheets, but now I was ca capturing much more information. Like the others, I fused the three segments together in its second firing to become one piece, then flipped them over and fused a third time to blur the joins between the different stock sheets, symbolizing the fading of memory. These memories that were so vivid when we first gathered them, that, but that have become reconfigured, perhaps even unrecognizably so. This one is two parts comfort to one part posterity. Here's one more of the 10 panels in this series, five parts attachment to three parts remedy. It is my hope that when you look at these works, you might begin to question how reliable your own memories are or the stories you hear from others, or that it might bring a new expectation to what our minds are really capable of, perhaps less than you might think. I'd like to thank the Columbia Kootenai Cultural Alliance for funding the research and fabrication of this project, as well as the Canada Council of, for the Arts for awarding me a travel grant to send me and my work here to Vancouver. Uh, please join us in the gallery across the road for the opening reception of this work, and please do let me know your thoughts in the comment book. Thanks so much for listening. Um, so, I. Uh, Cane work is when you are, um, so it's a hot, it's generally a hot glass process that um, you can build up layers um, within the glass. Have you ever seen rock candy been made at a, um, same principle is that you're starting from the inner core, adding layers because later you're going to be generally looking at the cross section. So starting from the core, building layers um, into a piece of, into hot, generally this kind of size of work, and then you're um, pulling across the room to hopefully get a uniform thickness because you want to use that as segments. So if you're using it as cane, you might chop it into 10 centimeter lengths, the whole length of the room, um, so that you can roll them up onto a piece that I showed, or you might chop them up and that becomes marini. So when you're chopping it up to look at the cross section, um, that becomes marini. So then you would um, line them up to roll them up. Okay, yeah, really good question. So one's for kiln and one's for the hot shop. So in the hot shop, the whole process is hot. Um, so um, when you pull it across the room, yeah, you're trying to get that uniform thickness. Um, takes two people, uh, and then it'll cool down at room temperature, and you'll use that cane or that marini to heat up again to make a hot glass piece. Um, so in kiln form, um, again, it's hot when it comes out of that kiln. Um, it's a different setup in that um, when I set up the kiln, it went in cold, and then I turn the kiln on, um, and that crucible, based on how I set up those layers, that's what will come out. That's what cross-section I'm expecting is based on the layers that I put the, of cold glass circles. Um, so that, um, the difference in that. You're still pulling yep, I'm pulling it hot, so it's still, um, yeah, still about 1500 Fahrenheit when it's um, pulling out. Um, and then it cools down in the same way, same for hot shop and kiln formed 
cane is that you won't cut it till it's cold um, and it'll just snap with tile cutters uh, and then you'll assemble it cold to either heat up again in the hot shop or to put in the kiln to work cold. Oh, 160 mesh. Yeah, so um, it is the dust that's going through. Yeah, and whatever's a little bit too coarse will stay um, and to not reuse that. So yeah, the essentially the glass dust is going through. So respirator and um, fan required. <laughs> and, a, and a steady hand walking that very long 10 feet over to the kiln. <laughs> I uh, graduated in 2006. Mm -hmm. Are you an ACAD grad as well? Yes. Oh, okay. Long time before that. Sure, yeah, we have a few more ACAD grads over here too, so we're, oh, uh, Uni, or, uh, Uni Alberta, what's the new acronym? It's not, it's, it doesn't roll off the tongue the same way. <laughs> it's ACAD. So who's teaching you? Um, Tyler, Natalie, Jim, uh, would have been there at that time. Um, Marty, yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, oh, actually I had uh, Norman Faulkner um, until the year that he retired, I believe. Yeah. And a few artists traveling through as well to spice it up a bit there. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you're going to expand on this work? The opportunity is there now that I've worked out the technique of the powder printing. Um, I feel like I've been working on this work for a year and a half and um, I'm proud of where it's come. Um, I don't know what I would change about it now. I feel like I've had a really long time to work this out for this show, and I'm, um, it has an opportunity, I think, to, uh, maybe not for this series, but to bring more imagery into other conceptual work that I'm, that I'm doing, so I'm glad for having this new technique now, um, but I think it needs, like, there could be a temptation to use it in too obvious a way. I, I don't want it to turn into production work. Um, I don't want it to turn into awards. I don't want it to go those other ways. Um, I guess I want to kind of keep it a bit sacred at this point. And your concept of memory? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, yeah, I think I absolutely could, could develop that more. I mean, like I say, it was from a CBC podcast a few years ago, and it's been like kind of formulating in my mind kind of since then how I could show that in a visual way. And then, you know, now it kind of comes up. Um, what's that uh, Malcolm Gladwell podcast? He did an episode as well last season, um, Revisionist History, about, yeah, another example of how, like, we, how we demonize these people that are, you know, getting it wrong, but we all get it wrong. It's just that they're caught and they're on TV, but we all get it wrong. Um, so to have these drastically different expectations for these public figures is not fair, um, but also like what I talked about with the real repercussions for what we think memory is worth, and it's worth much less, in, in my opinion. Sure, so all very, well, very personal of subject matter. Um, I mean, there's so much to draw from. As soon as I could, as soon as I, it clicked that I could take a photo of something and then get it on my glass, it was just like, like honestly, open those closet doors, like get in these fabrics that I want, like that, yeah, these textures. Um, so there's, I mean, there's so much more I, I, I could do for that. Yeah. Should we go have a look? Yeah. yeah.